Uh, so, hi, it's really fantastic and amazing to be here and be kicking off DPM Summit uh, in Las Vegas, a place that I have never been. Uh, it's a very strange place, a very cool place, a very interesting place, and I say that as someone who lived in Japan for two years, so my definition of weird place is kind of skewed. So. Again, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Brett mentioned the um, hashtag today, and then I am also on Twitter a lot, um, usually retweeting weird things or posting pictures of my cats or my kid and his crazy hair. So if you want to find me on Twitter or talk about me, this is how you do it. Uh, so hello, my name is Amanda. I look like this, in case you can't see me. Um, which some of you can't because it's a big room. And uh, as Brett said, I am uh, a contest strategist. I uh, work in higher ed and I've been at the university for 10 years in my current role for five. So you probably didn't come to this to hear about content strategy. Is anyone here familiar with content strategy? <laughs> Great. Uh, is anyone here a content strategist? You can be, um, <laughs> but you know what we are, you know what we do. Uh, so with this, the content strategy, and this isn't a content strategy talk, but you might have seen this. This is our quad that we work in where content strategy brings together content and people elements of substance, structure, workflow, and governance. Uh, sometimes I will try to like, carry this around and my boss or my grand boss or a dean will be like, hey, what do you do, internet person? I'm like, well, you see there's this quad and I'm in the middle of it. They don't get that. So I have an elevator pitch that says, I make sure that our content on the site is useful for the people who need it. And if that sounds interesting to them, they might say, tell me more, Internet Amanda. And the, otherwise, they might just say, oh, good, yes, my email's broken and the Wi-Fi is bad. Like, no, that's not, okay, cool, great. Uh, though I pointed this out at the content strategy conference and someone helpfully raised their hand and said, actually, that's user experience. Like, oh, okay, well, I guess I do some of that too because I work in higher ed, so we don't have a separate person for content strategy and UX. And I also do a little bit of IA and I'm a copywriter just because I have to wear a lot of hats. We don't have those kind of budget or resources for an individual person. Uh, now, Brett said I, uh, I was at the second DPM Summit in Austin, and after I came back from that, I realized, oh, we, we need project managers. We didn't really have anyone with the title or responsibilities of a project manager, and that's why a bunch of our projects were terrible. Uh, so I said, okay, well, that's a hat I'll wear, too, because our projects were winding up like this, and <laughs> that's not where we want to end up. So I also, in addition to all the other hats I wear, I wear a PM hat as well. It's not made of denim. Sorry, JT. So I love working in higher ed. I really love the work that I do. And most days, it is like this. Our uh, tagline at Minnesota is driven to discover. And it's beautiful maroon and gold, and it's an autumnal campus. And most days, it's, it's great. And some days, it's not. Some days, we're... We're just driven to disco. This is the best piece of graffiti I've seen on campus. Now I also, we're a really huge place. We have 23,000 employees, uh, and so it can be really hard to connect. However, our president, Eric Kaler, is on Twitter. And a few years ago, he tweeted this. Some advice for our incoming freshman uh, group, always cheer for the Gophers, that's our sports team mascot, and avoid those other rodents like Wolverines and Badgers, the mascots for Wisconsin and Michigan. Go Gophers, go for sports. Because I cannot resist something like this, I hopped in, being a huge nerd, pushed up my glasses and said, actually, they're mustelids. <laughs> Don't cheer for mustelids, it's a different thing. So, yeah, I still have a job. <laughs> go Gophers. <laughs> but thanks to Twitter, I could make this comment to our university president. And he never responded, but I'm sure he saw my response, and he's just like, oh, yeah, Amanda's right, good. Like, he knows. He knows that I, yeah. But really, I mean, 
tens of thousands of employees, you can't easily connect with a whole bunch of other people because there's just too many. And so the university is indeed home to organizational silos. We've got them a lot. Uh, this is not our org chart. This is something from the federal government. <laughs> who tons of love, if anyone here is from the federal government or state governments, I am right there with you guys. Um, but I think I Googled insane org chart and found this picture. Um, but you've got all these different groups. And even if you're not in higher ed, you're probably familiar with organizational silos where people group up, wall themselves off, and won't collaborate or talk to each other. Marcom won't talk to IT. Uh, physics won't talk to astrophysics because they are super different. And um, a college of liberal arts won't be caught dead talking to the college of design. My college once had an org chart that was so busted that Visio wouldn't let us make it. <laughs> Spoiler alert, you can't report to yourself. Visio pointed this out for us. We pointed it out to the dean and she was like, no. So I did the good thing that any uh, denizen of the internet did when I wanted to solve a problem. Uh, I saw that silos are an issue, so I Googled it. Turns out that everybody wants to break down silos, but no one seems to be able to do it. In fact, these blog posts about how to break down silos, breaking down silos, this is what we want to do, just kept being published again and again and again. Uh, everyone's having this problem, but it's not getting solved. Also, silos sometimes tend to work like this where you're not just in a silo, but your silo is in another silo, and you're somewhere in between those, like what do you do then? So what I'm gonna talk about today is not breaking down silos, but looking at the silos that you have in a different way. One of the ways that I've heard silos talked about uh, is something like this. Silos belong on farms. Uh, now, I take umbrage with this image of a sweet little dairy farm with a single silo, because bro, do you even Midwest? <laughs> this is what my silos look like. They look like grain elevators. Collections of silos, they're pulled together and linked at the top. So that connection element is critical. I live in Minneapolis, and I see multiple grain elevators every day on my commute to work on campus. Brief history lesson, because I love my city. Minneapolis is known as the Mill City. You may recognize Pillsbury Doughboy. Um, in 1900, 14% of the world's flour was milled in Minneapolis. The Pillsbury A Mill made enough flour in one day for 12 million loaves of bread. Milling was huge, a massive industry. But the march of time, agriculture changed, food changed, uh, transportation changed. A lot of what we do and the industries involved in that changed. So Minneapolis, like so many cities and towns across the United States, now have huge empty grain elevators. This is one chunk, this is uh, one side of an 80 silo ADM like uh, sequence. People in Minneapolis call it United Crushers because of the amazing graffiti. Uh, it's part of a larger like complex that has 187 silos in it. None of these are used, and they haven't been used for decades. Hilariously, you can see this whole complex of unused bad silos like a block away from our stadium. So drive down University Avenue, and there they are. So I'm passing physical silos all over town on my way into campus. And of course, the thing that I thought about next was historical architecture, because of course. I'm also a huge architecture nerd, and this is super fun weekend reading for me. Is anyone familiar with Stuart Brand or this book? This book is wonderful for a whole ton of reasons. But I was reading Brand one weekend, and a quote from this in particular jumped out, because Brand talks about how buildings learn, that instead of tearing something down and rebuilding it, we can teach a building. And he said that a building's responsibility is to not only remain sturdy with age, but to remain appropriate to its users as they themselves evolve. Now, real silos have done this. Uh, these are the gold medal flower silos in Minneapolis, used as a projection canvas for an, uh, an all-night art show called Northern Spark. Um, in Iowa, say you lived in Iowa, and you really wanted to ice climb. Iowa, not known for its you know, plenty of sheer cliffs. Well, take an out of view silo, run some hoses up it and turn them on. Now you can ice climb in Iowa. 
Back to Minneapolis, there's a sequence of, uh, there's this condo building uh, on the north side of one of the lakes, Bede Magaska, that's in town. And um, it took me going past it forever until someone said that used to be a grain elevator. And once you see it, of course it did. It wasn't torn down, it was reshaped and adapted and reused. Uh, and now they're kind of nice condos. Uh, I looked it up, they're about, 300 to $450,000, so all the West Coast people are now freaking out because they're like, oh, let's move to Minneapolis, this is amazing. Minneapolis is amazing, you should move there, this is what it looks like in April. So organizational silos, however, are gonna be a little trickier to teach than actual, um, actual physical silos. So let's dig in a little more about what and why they are. Sociology 1001, humans form groups. We do this. We find people who are like us or in similar situations. Uh, it's both comfortable and an evolutionary necessity. Uh, we're social species and grouping up is a marker of that. Uh, also, when we're in a group, it gives us protection from crap. So you're in a group, but you're not in that group. And if something bad happens to that group, it's not your group. I am a knitter. I am not a crocheter. If there's some kind of crochet hook shortage, doesn't affect me, I'm not a crocheter. I, all the rest of the knitters, let's all get together later too. That's the knitting shout out. However, if one silo in an elevator takes a tumble, the structural integrity of all of it can be compromised. And then things start to get gross. We get to this us versus them mentality, even though we have a lot of similarities. Uh, and then, you know, we'd rather keep us better than them. We're unwilling to share. Efficiency gets wrecked. You might hear this. I'm sure hope all of my hard work is being secretly duplicated elsewhere, said no one ever. Morale gets reduced. And you wonder, how can anything get done and will anything ever change? We find this especially in my industry of higher ed. Now, a lot of you I know work in agencies um, or are in the private sector, but some of you may work adjacent to higher ed. And even if you don't, I think that we can bring a lot of weird knowledge to you that can help out. Because our industry is old. Oxford is over 900 years old. The universities and madrasas in Fez are even older. Harvard was founded 140 years before America was a thing. Even if you don't work in higher ed, take a look at the industries either that you're in if you're in-house or you're working with if you're at an agency because although they might be new, things might be based on an older tradition and things that you hold on to. I simplify higher ed by calling it the idea factory because this is the guts of what we do. Our mission surrounding knowledge, researching that knowledge, developing the knowledge, teaching the knowledge, and giving it away makes us an idea factory because nobody does something like this alone. We just can't. We need a group of people to do it. Um, no one is a lone genius, nobody. So with looking at all of this, I learned a couple things about motivation. Part of this came from looking at faculty, which who here has ever worked with higher ed faculty before? Oh guys, we've gotta, we gotta get together tonight at the reception. Uh, so I learned some things about motivation, and motivation both in higher ed and I think kinda overall comes down to two factors. One is resource scarcity. Um, that there are only so many things to go around. And the idea that there are not infinite resources for everything, stress people out. Uh, you'll have different resources, it's not just money and it's not just Krispy Kreme donuts, there's not enough space. I have indeed shared offices with two, three, four, five, and six other people. I've had offices that not only didn't have windows, but were two doors away from a window, and my coworkers used to have an office under a loading dock where they would get truck fumes, because that's the space we had. Not enough time. Someone, this goes around the internet every once in a while where someone says you have the same amount of hours in the day as Beyonce. And while that's true, like Beyonce probably makes more money than I do, just guessing. And she also has a whole bunch of other people. So don't ever let that get you down. Yes, you do have the same amount of hours in the day as Beyonce, but you have different lots of resources. Not enough people. People are also a resource, uh, like Beyonce's staff. Think about your teams. Couldn't, don't you think of something that you could do with one more person? 
you could find something for them to do that would make things just a little easier. Same thing with money. If you had an extra $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, what else you could do with it? I haven't yet met a person that said, you know what? Our project is uh, funded just fine. We don't need any extra money. No thank you. <laughs> so with this resource scarcity, because there's only so much stuff to go around, you get jealousy. In higher ed, sometimes it comes from funding. 10 people have brilliant, amazing ideas, but only five of them can get funded for different values of funding. Um, someone has a kind of crazy bad idea, but sometimes even those lead to huge breakthroughs. But again, there's only so much to go around. So then folks get jealous that they did not get a thing. And when you add ego into this, it goes from they have something that I want to they have something I deserve. Uh, tiny things then turn into huge blow-ups. And although this is true of higher ed, I'm sure you can all think of a project where this applies. Sayers Law, which is the politics are so vicious because the stakes are so low. This is where people don't actually talk about the real problems, but they're really angry because you won't change the color of yellow on the homepage because that color of yellow is proven to make other people mad like they are mad right now. Like, this isn't about our yellow, this is about our students and our users. They're like, the yellow has to go. Neat, neat. So here we are. This is the, you know, the kickoff for Digital Project Management Summit, and I hope you're all feeling good <laughs> about what it's like to work in organizational silos. But don't worry, I am here with a good message and good news because I come from one of the biggest, craziest silos ever, the Ivory Tower. One of the luxuries we have in this industry uh, is also one of the things that frustrates people the most about us and that we move very slow. We move exceedingly slow. I once had a meeting, a project meeting. We had a meeting, got some stuff done, and then we said, okay, we need to schedule our next meeting. Well, we'd already had one meeting that week, so that week's out. Um, next week was gonna be welcome week. Uh, and freshmen are on campus getting ready. The week after that is first week of class, so school comes back into session. The week after that is add drop deadlines, so there's gonna be a lot of paperwork, so we'll meet in a month. No one in this room had anything to do with welcome week, with freshmen, with teaching, with paperwork, but everything was just gonna feel so busy, so let's just wait. Now this is the crazy I know, and this is why I love to work in higher ed. But this extra time gives us a little extra space to explore and see how things can work. And I was thinking about higher ed when I saw this quote again, that just like a building, we have a responsibility to remain sturdy with age and appropriate to our users as they themselves evolve. Companies have this, businesses have this, products have this. What stays the same and what do you change? So, Brand encourages, when you think about a building changing, that you don't think about a building as one thing. A building actually has a lot of components. You have the site where a building is, the structure on top of it, um, the skin or things that are on the outside of the building. Then you move inside, the services, what does a building itself do? The space plan, how is it laid out to provide those services? And then the stuff or the actual physical things inside the building. You can make a change to a building in any one of these ways. They just take different amounts of time. You can change the stuff in a building in days or months. Maybe a space plan for a large building might take a longer time. Um, a structure could stay the same or change, again, over 30, 300 years. A site is functionally eternal. It's a space that it exists. But these condos, um, they used to be grain elevators, and now they are condos. So what they did is they joined them horizontally because it would really suck if every time you wanted to go to the bathroom, you had to go to the roof first. That's not how that building needs to work. Also, I don't even need to show you the picture of Minnesota winter again, just that. So they're connected in. So this can help us think about changing our organizational silos or encouraging change if you're working in and around a uh, community which has big ones. Uh, and that is working horizontally. So making these connections between silos, between things. And you can find this and work horizontally by asking who else? Who else 
has had this problem? Who else has solved this problem? Who else looks like they're doing it right? If you see um, a, a website that doesn't look like it got dressed in the dark, reach out, find the team, talk to people. The worst they can say is no. And you do have other peers, and wonderfully, you are in a room with hundreds of them right now. Also, this part, the resource scarcity and jealousy can motivate uh, kind of this horizontal communication. Uh, once I was invited down to probably one of our biggest institutional rivals, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Anyone here from Wisconsin? You can, you can woo louder, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to share uh, ideas of what we were doing at Minnesota. And a colleague of mine at Madison said, can you come down here and tell us about how to do it? So I went down for a day and I talked to them. And I said, this is how we're doing, and this is what's hard, and this is what's good. I facilitated them talking to each other. And at the end, someone came up to me and said, I can't believe Minnesota let you come here and tell us how you work. And I was so sad. But I mean, of course you'd think that. Here's the stuff that our president says about not rooting for badgers. And then there's the picture that took me forever to find. Here's the Wisconsin badger and Goldie Gopher being friends. Almost every other picture is them like body slamming each other. But look, they can be friends. So you can build these strong bridges. And it's not only bridges that you build for yourself. It's not only you reaching out. It's you finding two things and connecting them. Uh, Megan McInerney, who I have known for quite a while and you'll be hearing from later on, uh, is brilliant at this. She will say, oh, Amanda, you work in higher ed and Abby needs to, is looking at changing roles into content strategy. You two need to connect. So you can do this as well, bringing together other connections. But when you build this bridge, don't be the troll underneath it. Don't seek to control these relationships. Let people connect and then move away. In silos, you can also work vertically. So this is about empowering leadership, your bosses, your grand bosses, your great grand bosses. This came from a story that my boss had shared with me once. Uh, here's my boss, it's a pretty accurate drawing. <laughs> he found himself at a meeting with uh, our chief of staff and uh, they worked together in the same college, the same silo. And the chief of staff said, why don't you come along with me to a meeting because there's a chief of staff in another college that wants to learn about how we kind of do our collaborative model of work. Uh, hats, those are the chief of staff. So my boss found that if he was talking directly to the other chief of staff, they were talking kind of on a weird level. The other chief of staff had a bunch of questions that my boss wasn't really equipped to answer because they had really different roles in the whole process. So instead, my boss met with our chief of staff first and talked to him. He said, what kind of questions do you anticipate coming up? What kind of things do you like about this model? Do we want to tell other people about this model? And then that chief of staff, they could have chief of staff chats, which is I'm sure exactly what they're called, and talk about things that are related to them. Also, my boss is not always going to be in those meetings. But when the chief of staffs talk, our chief of staff is now empowered to talk to other chiefs of staff about what we do. Talking with leadership, talking with folks above you is wonderful. And when it's done well, it should be like a good therapy session. A lot of asking questions. What do you understand about this? What do you wish you understand? What do you think? What do you feel? Tell me more. Because then folks will know that you're a person that can be trusted. You can give folks answers. They could maybe ask you a weird question but not feel bad about it. I had a dean come up to me once um, and she strides up and she says, um, Amanda, I have a question about social media. I said, okay. Are you asking me because I do social media or because I'm young? And she's like, I just need to know, what is the, what is the college's strategy for Tinder? <laughs> I said, what do you think Tinder is? <laughs> and she said, I don't know. I heard about it on some news thing of all the kids using Tinder. <laughs> Are we using Tinder with the kids? And I said, nope. 
And I explained to her what Tinder is, and she said, oh, but she didn't feel embarrassed or sad because she'd asked me and I'd let her know. She knew I was a person she could come to, say, hey, I've got this idea. And I'm like, you can't date a college. So you're empowering them, you're helping them out, and this kind of listening and collaboration is good motivation. Bad motivation is fear. Motivating, you can motivate a scared person to do a lot of things, but it's not sustainable. It's also an ugly way to be. Now, a lot of you, I'm sure, just had the reaction of, this isn't me. I don't work by bullying and intimidation and gross stuff like that. However, fear motivation can show up in ways that are often well-intentioned. So I am going to show you a video that is a little loud and it has a couple warnings. A ton of unchecked privilege, a bunch of unsighted research, and a Fatboy Slim song. So here we go. Some of you may have seen this, Eric Qualman's social media revolution video. We don't have a choice. The choice is how about, there, he's quoted himself. Neat. This isn't how populations work. That's not, we don't live in Facebook. Okay, next thing. Uh, under 30, here come the millennials, marching forward, the army of the young. Uh, and we'd all love to lose our, don't take our phones. We'll smell nothing for the rest of our life. Um, or people on a mobile device that, oh man, that's just a whole equality and access to water. Oh, next, okay, cool. Mobile and social are an emerging. Oh no, I was an English major. This good. They're emerging. Oh no, okay, great. Uh, video will account for two thirds of mobile usage. And that's why everyone's spending money. Great, okay, more videos, but we don't need two seconds. New members join LinkedIn. That's the enrollment of the Ivy League, the Harvard, Yale, Penn. No, 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 no. This video makes me nuts, and I've seen it a whole bunch of times. This is the video that one of your leadership members sees, and they're like, everyone's spending money on video. Where's our video? We're going to be left out. We need the video. They're like, but what we're doing doesn't really lend itself. We need video, two thirds, the video, the money, the money on the phones. This just freaks people out, and they want to do anything. I mean, why wouldn't someone be scared? This video literally starts with a siren noise. Like, you're all ready to be freaked out. And it also references one of the things, so oftentimes we'll take a video like this and we'll forward it on to people. I've seen this video introduced as, before we get going, I just want everyone to be on the same page with what we're dealing with here. This also comes to very well-intentioned forwards about our favorite group and my generation, millennials. We've been saving and killing things since 1981. <laughs> Here's some things that millennials are killing. We're killing Applebee's, we're killing napkins, we're killing diamonds, we're killing beer, we're killing motorcycles, we're killing gyms. We are killing these things. But, good news, millennials are also saving things. We are saving libraries, we are saving coffee, we are saving vinyl records, we are saving beer, we're saving motorcycles? We're saving gyms? I see stuff like this that shows up usually every September when our new group of freshmen shows up. And someone says, here's some things to just give you perspective on these new 18 and 19 year olds who are gonna be on campus being young and near you. Okay. <laughs> things like, did you know that the incoming class of freshmen have never licked a stamp? Did you know that the incoming class of freshmen had no first-hand experience with the charismatic celebrity of Princess Diana? <laughs> Listen, I can understand what history was and that people have existed before me, and I didn't need to be alive at the same time to know the charismatic celebrity of Teddy Roosevelt, the weaponized badass, but he died in 1919. Sub note, I was born after that. <laughs> but this kind of stuff, it's othering, it's gross. When you say millennials are, it's this group. How do we talk to millennials? Talk to people. Stop grouping folks in. And also, when you talk about millennials, make sure you are not using it as grumpy shorthand for kids these days. Because every generation, 
when you were young, someone thought that you were entitled, that you were lazy, and you were probably both killing and saving a lot of past industries. Like the, the, the greatest generation that fought in World War II, they killed the ice box. Who's going to deliver ice anymore? All these ice delivery, man. We made it, guys. We're still like society is trucking along and the ice box is gone. Also, never licked a stamp. We invented self-adhesive stamps. Also, I didn't invent them. Someone else did because licking stamps sucked. Who liked that? Ugh. So give context, do the work, be better. Look for when you're using this kind of shorthand and see if it's actually motivating with fear. Um, because this doesn't drive people to best practice. It drives them to be afraid of doing nothing. And they lash out and try to do anything and they're scared of being left behind or doing something wrong. The other good news about organizational silos is that they're a metaphor. You are not literally trapped in a metal death tube. This gives us, again, the protection from crap. People ask me, do you like working at the University of Minnesota? And I do. I love it. It's wonderful, and I don't have the Sunday night dread. I'm stoked for my next weeks to come up. But then they'll say, oh, I should work at the U. And I say, hmm, where are you going to work? Because a lot of us know of places where some parts of it, wonderful. Some parts of it, toxic, do not work there. There's a whole bunch of crap going on. You don't want to be a part of this. The real world silo example for this is the appetizingly named vomitoxin. A friend of mine grew up on a farm. I said, Nick, tell me about silos. And he said, vomitoxin. And I said, <laughs> go on. Uh, the USDA restricts vomitoxin to one part per million in crops. If vomitoxin uh, is infected to a greater ratio or a greater degree than that, you've lost the crops in that silo. That's why you separate out things into different silos. You have not lost your entire crop. Uh, we know of places and organizations that are infected like this, that are better avoided because of circumstance or people or leadership. If you look around and you realize that you might be in one of these, you can get out because some teams are just broken. However, change can happen. Um, you're about to start two amazing days of learning and networking and connecting with a whole bunch of people. And uh, I encourage you to take your learnings and think about it in the context of this. If you're looking at your organization, your work, your silos, your clients, what is a stuff level problem? What is a space plan level problem? What's a structural problem that might take a lot longer? Folks say that higher ed is really challenging to change, that it's like an aircraft carrier that takes forever to turn. And I saw an aircraft carrier once, and it's like this whole like, giant skyscraper just laid down in the ocean and is slowly moving. But large organizations aren't aircraft carriers. They're fleets of ships. There are parts of them that can be more nimble, that could take a risk, go out, and come back. But if the whole fleet starts to turn, then the aircraft carrier can turn too. And with, since this is the beginning of the conference, I thought it's a good time to bring up one of my favorite internet people, Zay Frank. Uh, Zay Frank is a writer and an artist, and in 2005, he had uh, a daily video show called The Show. Monday through Friday, he'd put up a video talking a little bit about news, about wacky information, and he did it for a full year, and it was wonderful. After that was done, uh, he put it to bed, did some other projects, and then he decided to come back to it about 10 years later. And the first video that he published is one called The Invocation for Beginnings. I won't show the whole thing because it is very long. I just pulled some parts of it. But his idea is that starting itself, no, I don't have a video. We're okay, thanks. <laughs> video fake out. <laughs> but look up the video later. One of the quotes that he has for this is he talks about the fear of starting. And even though we're at the beginning of the summit, eventually you will go home, you will go back to things. And remember that you can't prepare forever. He says, my pencils are sharp enough, even the dull ones will make a mark. And that life isn't just a sequence of waiting for things to be done. When I was reviewing these slides, I realized that this was a really apt slide for this group 
because a lot of people hate the process and they only want the outcome. Oh, but we love a good process. So when you're thinking about starting, you can start small. You can pick something little. But just remember to start. Thank you. <laughs>